fail. There we go. <laughs> maybe if I keep on playing with the batteries, it will work. Or maybe not. Okay. Let's do it the old-fashioned way. Oh, no. There we go. So, uh, a bit about me. Uh, I'm Mark Goodwin. Um, I work for Mozilla, but I also have involvement with OWASP. Together with um, Jamie Shaw, I look after the East Midlands chapter. Is there anyone from the East Midlands here? Oh, just me. Okay. Um, and um, part of the reason why I'm doing this talk is because um, if you're involved in OWASP, you care about the open web, you care about security. Um, but also, putting my Mozilla hat on, and while well, this talk is my own personal opinions and not those of my employer, um, if you're building a platform, you also have a responsibility to help people to secure that platform, to make sure that they're using that platform in the best way possible. So uh, I think it falls to, to me as a Mozillian to help people make use of stuff that we've built uh, into the web platform to, um, to fix problems that they might have otherwise. And um, I think this is important for a number of reasons. We have data on what happens when this doesn't um, take place. So if we look at um, the other side of the web platform, the server frameworks that people use, if we look at tools like um, PHP, highly popular, a lot of self-taught developers making use of it, a lot of people producing really good stuff, a lot of people producing stuff which isn't quite so good. And when security features find their way into that platform, it takes a while for people to make use of them. Who, who here does sort of pen test type work, application security testing? Um, do you do much PHP stuff at all? Do you look at many PHP applications? How many uh, of the current apps you look at uh, fail to do things properly with regards to uh, database input, SQL injection type stuff? So big number, small number, big number, okay. So PHP's had support for doing the right thing for quite a long time now. And talking to people who um, I know that still do web application pen testing, it's still a major problem, people not making use of the right APIs for, for avoiding problems that they should be able to avoid. So I think it's important to champion the, the platforms, the security of the platforms that we use, and I think CSP is really underused. And to give you an idea, um, I saw a um, blog a while ago from, from Vericode. They do a security header survey. I think Shodan did the first one, but Vericode are doing it as well now. And um, CSP is one of the headers they looked at. And out of the top million sites, there are currently about 300 using the site, using the CSP directors properly in um, their HTTP response headers. So out of, a, out of a million, 300 isn't many. Um, so I'd like people to use CSP more. I'd like you to go home and tell the people that you work with that CSP is good and they should use it too. So that's why I'm here. Okay. And that's the wrong window, so that's not going to work. There we go. So the plan for the talk, we're going to talk a little bit about cross-site scripting. We all know about cross-site scripting, but it bears um, reiterating because it tells us something about the design of CSP, why it does some of the things it does, why it stops some of the things that it stops. And then we're going to have a look at CSP, what it is, why it works the way that it does. And then we're going to move on to some things that are kind of difficult about CSP. CSP um, doesn't give you what it does for free, there's a cost to be paid uh, by developers mostly. And then we're going to have a look at how we can make some of these things a little bit less awkward because um, there are some new features to um, recent versions of the CSP specification, the upcoming 1.1 or, or 2 as it's now called spec, which can help alleviate a lot of the issues that people have had with CSP. And finally, we're going to have a look at some common pitfalls when people our design policies for their sites. Okay, so that's the plan. Um, let's talk about cross-site scripting. Who is um, completely happy with cross-site scripting, what it does, why well, it's a problem? Put your hand up if you're completely happy with cross-site scripting. Okay. Um, by the way, before we get any further in, um, put your hand up if you're a developer, if you do developer type stuff normally. Okay, if you normally do security stuff, put your hand up. Okay, um, if, you've, uh, if you've seen stuff on CSP before, put your hand up. Okay, okay. just give you an idea how to, how to pitch what I'm talking about. So generally, people categorize cross-site scripting to three different categories. You have reflected cross-site scripting, 
stored cross-site scripting and DOM cross-site scripting. Those are strange categorizations because you can, you can store DOM-based attacks some of the time in things like cookies and local storage. Um, and yeah. So what, what I'll do is I'll do a little demonstration of what cross-site scripting looks like in the real world. Um, here we have a vulnerable page that I made earlier. Um, here we go. So we've got a page here that's got a vulnerability. And if we put a request parameter um, on the URL like this, it gets written out to the response. Except it doesn't. Why isn't that working? I bet I know. Hmm? Yeah. There we go. So um, it takes the contents of the request, let's say, request parameter called test. That gets written out into the response. And it's easy for an attacker to turn that into something bad. We've probably all seen this done before, even if we haven't done it ourselves. Um, actually, we need the script tag. I don't want of these already in there. Script alert. One, two, three. Typo. This is why you should never, use, you should always use mirroring, but then you can't see your notes, right? <laughs> there we go. Okay, so we've just did an alert there. It could be way worse. Um, and that's reflected. That's where it comes straight from the request. Stored is where something that's um, happened in an, a previous request it end, has ended up in a database in the back end somewhere or in the file and gets replayed later on. And, and the, the key point here is that... Um, Something that the attacker has control over, in this case, something that's in the URL that the user clicks, um, ends up running in the context of the target application. And that's bad news because, uh, generally speaking, if you can cross-site script, you can completely own the application. Um, DOM cross-site scripting is slightly different because um, when you have a DOM XSS flaw, um, nothing necessarily ends up going to the server. Um, I did have one here, but I'm actually going to use a different one. Let's go back to this page over here. And this time we're going to use a different document. Where is it? I think I've got a some XSS there. There we go. Um, and with this one, uh, what happens is um, if we put something in the uh, ref part of the URI, the hash part, sometimes, as people sometimes call it. Focus to the right place. And refresh the page. There we go. So that's pulling something from the URL. And there's a bit of script that does, does stuff with it. Now, um, as it happens in this case, um, it's possible to exploit this. So what we're going to do is we're going to have a look at, little look at the code that we've got. Um, here we can see that there's a function that's loaded when the documents, um, function that's run when the documents loaded, and it does this here. Okay. Um, now, what's interesting about this attack, um, I'll, I'll talk about it while I'm exploiting it, is that um, nothing ever actually goes to the server because it's in the the hash part of the URL. Um, there we go. I think one I did earlier. Because it's in the hash part of the URL, um, it never gets sent to the server, which means if you're relying on something like a web application firewall to protect you from cross-site scripting attacks and the like, um, it's not going to help you at all. Um, and this is why just server-side solutions to preventing cross-site scripting can't help as much. So that's, that's a bit about cross-site scripting. Now, um, this helps us understand some of the design decisions behind CSP, because... Um, we can think of cross-site scripting as being like a bunch of other vulnerability classes that we might be used to. So there's a common theme in application security, uh, a common um, source of vulnerability. Um, and I want you to think about um, the following things. Think about um, SQL injection. Think about buffer overflows. Think about command injection. Think about... Um, things like use after free. 
When all of those things are exploited, there's a specific thing that's happening. What, what do all of those things have in common in terms of what's actually going wrong? Any ideas? Yes, you have code injection. Yeah. Yeah, so you've got code injection and the um, expectation is different from the code that's already running. Uh, and in all of these cases, the code that gets executed was originally stuff that should have been treated as data. Okay? So all of these things happen as a result of data in the application becoming confused with code and stuff happening. And in the case of your injection flaws, usually there's something missing that um, tells the application how to distinguish between the two. Um, in the case of some of the lower level issues, maybe something's longer than something expects, or, or, or maybe something um, should have been let go of by the application but hasn't been. But in all of these cases, it's the separation of the code and the data that becomes the problem. And um, this is the case with cross-site scripting, because what happens is you have um, user input, whether it comes from the user directly or whether it comes from the, the URL or, or the DOM or the request or something like that. Uh, and it ends up being put into the document in such a way that when the document is parsed, um, the browser doesn't know um, where what the server meant to send stops and where, the server, where what the server actually sends stops in terms of the delineation of the different bits of HTML and JavaScript and stuff like that. So um, if we can fix this, we can fix cross-site scripting. And, and this is really what motivated the design of CSP. So CSP, um, I think, started out with some conversations between um, web AppSec professionals, sort of middle of last decade, and ended up being a, a standard that was written by Brandon Stern and Gervais Markham at Mozilla. And, and the original proposal is a little bit different from what we have in CSP today. Um, it's, it's lost a couple of the features that um, were fiddly and slowed things down, um, but it's also lost a little bit of its expressiveness. Um, so, its name gives you a clue as to, to, as to what it is and how it works. Uh, it is a policy for content security. And we know about policies and security. They're, they're things which we can enforce uh, and they have an effect. Um, and content security, the, the reason, the reason it, it, um, it got this name is actually a, um, a hangover from the way some, things, some internals of Firefox were named. They, they had content policies anyway. And this is a special content policy for applying security stuff to a document. And the interesting thing is that it allows you to take an existing um, document and say to the browser, OK, I want you to treat this in this way. So let's take, for example, the cross-site scripting we had earlier, where something that was entered in the URL ended up being executed to script. It can say, well, I've got this document, and actually it's supposed to be a static document, and it's supposed to not have any script in line within the document at all. So what we're going to do is we're going to say, um, I want you to allow scripts to be included from the same server that this has been served from, but I don't want anything in line within the document, and I don't want any script-valued attributes um, within the document. So if you've got a button with an on-click handler or something, ignore the on-click handler because that's an injection point as well. So that's what um, CSP is. That's why it was designed the way that it has been. Uh, and here's an example policy, and we can start to build up a picture of how the different parts work. So there are a number of different directives. Each directive tells the uh, CSP implementation within your browser how to handle the document. And a bunch of them deal with sources. So you can say, by default, I want you to make sure that you're only getting stuff from certain places. So by default, I only want you to load scripts from self or the origin that the document was loaded from. Uh, and then you can be a bit more fine-grained. You can override bits of that for certain things. So you could say, for example, I'm OK with getting images from over here, or I'm all right with getting objects from over there, or I'm all right with um, XHR requests being made to a particular place. So all of these directives that deal with, with sources um, are to do this. So in this case, default source, uh, anything by default can only be served from the same origin as this file, OK? Um, with the exception of, of objects, and uh, I don't want any of those. And then we can do things like we can report on what might have gone wrong when applying this policy to the document. So there's a feature called report URI, and this allows us to say, OK, um, anything goes wrong, I want you to send it to this place. And what it will do, it will post some JSON with a report of the CSP violation. 
to the URL that you, su you supply there. Um, and that's fairly straightforward. It's not hugely difficult to understand. And um, anyone who has access to um, a shell account for web hosting can probably set their own headers and things. Um, so most of the time, if you're using PHP, you can um, set headers. Uh, some web hosts disallow it. Um, particularly if you're hosting static content and you've only got FTP access or something like that, you might have difficulty. But um, there are um, things in the newer versions of the specification to work around that particular issue. So that's what a CSP looks like. That's an example CSP. Um, so um, there are two directives that you particularly need to know about because they are things which can be used to make the policy um, weaker than what is probably sensible by default. And those are um, unsafe inline, which hints at what it is. It allows you to have inline scripts within your doc document and um, certainly the injection point that we um, saw in the two examples would have been hit if we'd allowed that. And um, secondly, unsafe eval. Now, uh, who is comfortable with JavaScript in here? Do you all know what eval does? Well, it's fairly, fairly obvious from the name. Eval, if you, if you give it a string parameter, will um, interpret and execute that, um, that string. So it's a way of executing arbitrary code within JavaScript. And um, if people use it wrong, it can be bad. Um, so if you see a, a CSP with unsafe inline or unsafe eval, um, it's good to have a, a sniff around and see if you can find some problems. So um, I started with a bit of a sob story about how few of the top million sites use CSP. Um, it's not actually all as bad as I made out because um, of those top million sites, relatively few of them are absolutely huge and a bunch of the absolutely huge ones do make use of CSP. So for example, um, we all use Twitter, right? Um, the Twitter web application, um, the main website, as yet does not support CSP, but they're working on it. Um, but absolutely everything else does. So TweetDeck, the mobile versions of their sites, um, their blog, um, a lot of high traffic stuff served by Twitter already supports CSP. They're waiting on a, on a feature that's coming in, in two, and I'll talk more about that later. Um, there's also a, another um, set of large sites which are waiting on something becoming commonplace before they turn CSP on their web properties as well. So at, at the moment, it doesn't have traction in many of the top million sites, but that's changing quickly. And um, there are good examples of people using CSP right that you can look at. And the Twitter examples are really excellent. They've done a, a pretty good job on a lot of their um, systems. Um, and um, CSP isn't just used in web applications. Um, so in the architecture of, of most modern web browsers, you have um, an engine, well, a set of engines that does stuff like networking and rendering and um, JavaScript and all that sort of stuff. Uh, and then you have um, user interface, you have the browser Chrome itself. And in both of the um, major open source browsers, the uh, top layer is part native and part um, effectively um, HTML. Um, in Firefox, there, there are bits of, H, bits of HTML and bits of Zool, which is um, an XML-based thing, which is close enough that we can learn, learn a lot of the same lessons that we, we uh, learn from doing web stuff to that. And it, it goes without saying, really, that if you have a vulnerability in your browser front end of the nature that we've looked at here, then that can be a bad thing, because if you can run script in the context of the browser front end, then you've owned the browser. Um, and so uh, Chrome have already applied content security policy to the bits of the browser UI that are written using HTML. And we're doing the same at Mozilla at the moment for Firefox. Um, and also, um, there are various projects underway where people are using web technologies to build applications. Now, um, I don't know how many of you have played with the uh, Firefox OS at all. But Firefox OS um, has an interesting challenge for web developers and security people 
in that everything on the device, uh, even the front end stuff that we ship, is written in HTML5. So the, the phone home screen, the phone keyboard, the camera app, the video app, all HTML5. Uh, if you're writing an application, then you have the same constraints. But by necessity, because of that, we have to create new web APIs that allow people to do things that are potentially more sensitive than people would expose in a normal browser. So your normal browser, for example, uh, doesn't have access to your contacts unless you're doing something weird. Um, your normal browser doesn't, for example, have um, access to, um, to the camera without things like the Get User, Me Me Get User Media API, which, which pops things up. You, there, there are various things that you want unprompted in a mobile app that you would ask for on the web. So because of that, it's really important that applications that can do dangerous things um, can't do dangerous things in the, in the context of attackers' um, uh, wishes. So, by default, anything that uses the privileged APIs within that environment has a fairly restrictive CSP applied. So, whilst there might not be many sites uh, in the top million that use CSP, there are um, hundreds of thousands of applications and um, probably um, upwards of a billion applications on people's desktops making use of it in, in one form or another. So, that's... Um, Interesting. Now, th this is the bit which I'm, I'm guessing people are most interested in. Um, maybe you've read about CSP, maybe you think it's a cool thing. Um, maybe it didn't look ready yet, or there was a barrier to adopting it in the organizations you work for. Um, and the key problem really is that um, the web is mostly already there, right? It's growing fast, um, it's, it's roughly doubling every couple of years in terms of the number of sites. Um, but a lot of what we value the web for is already out there. And the web as a platform is very strong because there's already all this stuff. And if you have an existing website and you want to uh, um, apply a CSP to it, there is some pain associated with that. And um, so we have to secure the web that we have and not just the web that we want to build. And the web that we have, um, it has inline scripts, it has inline styles, it has script valued attributes all over its HTML. It has um, use of eval here and there uh, and things like that. So um, that is a bit of a problem. And some people who are involved with CSP and its standardization are kind of excited about the fact that it forces developers to do things in a certain way because um, those of us that architect things um, like to have things like clean separation of, of the logic of an application in the presentation and, and we maybe look down our noses at things where everything's mashed together. But, but this is the web and people mash things together and it's part of the beauty of it. So if you've got an existing framework or a new one where the creators didn't know about CSP uh, or if you've got a large application where there's a bunch of stuff that um, already won't work, um, then you might have to start opening up. You might have to start using those dangerous directives like unsafe inline and unsafe eval. And, and by the time you've applied both of those, basically the benefit of CSP is completely lost. So um, people have held off using CSP because by default it's fairly restrictive. Um, and sometimes when people try and get around that, they find that their policy is too relaxed and therefore it's completely useless. Um, so we start to see that it's awkward and we need to think about what we can do better. So there was a lot of feedback from the initial spec for CSP. CSP1 was attempted by a bunch of people, implemented by a few of those, and a lot of work went into making the, the next version of the spec a lot more usable by um, normal developers. And as a result, two things have happened. Firstly, the people that went off and tried using CSP and found it painful, but like the benefits, have gone off and fixed a bunch of stuff. And that's great news. It's always great when people fix um, a problem. So initially, if things like jQuery didn't work because they made use of eval, and people went off and they followed a bunch of bugs on jQuery saying it doesn't work on CSP sites, so people went off and fixed the various issues. Um, not just jQuery, there are lots of other JavaScript um, front-end libraries which now support CSP, a, a few that don't. Um, and there are various web frameworks which are also being developed with um, 
knowledge of CSP in mind. So a bunch of the Django guys really like CSP, and um, James Sokol wrote a pretty good CSP um, middleware for Django called Django CSP, which allows you to, at the project level, define a bunch of directives and how you want things to work. Um, and that's great because um, it means that if you're using Django and, and some of the stuff that it automatically generates for you, you can expect it to work nicely with CSP, and that's good as well. Um, but, but most importantly, CSP's gained a few new features which can make things a little bit easier for developers. Um, there are um, three that I'm going to mention, two that I'm going to talk about in a little bit more detail. Um, the, the first, which I'm going to kind of ignore, is um, meta support. So I mentioned earlier on that some people have issues with um, their web host not allowing them to set headers. Um, the next version of the CSP standard will include support for setting a meta tag at the beginning of the document, which says, I want to apply this policy. Um, I don't like that very much because if you've got an injection point early on and you don't have a policy applied already, then that can um, be a potential problem. Um, but the other two things that are really good for developers, the first of these is a thing called um, nonce source and the second is a thing called hash source. And these are two things which are used to get around the problem of wanting or, or having existing inline scripts. So let's have a look at how those work. Um, I did another demo with one of these. Where was it? I think it's on here. There we go. This is the bit where you get to laugh at me not being able to drive my laptop properly because it's on the other screen. There we go. So this is a version of the um, thing that we found an XSS in earlier on. And um, we're going to try and cross-site script it again. Well, I've done one already. There we go. That's handy. There we go. And you'll notice that it failed. There's nothing wrong with the attempted exploit. But if we have a look at the console, we'll see why. Refresh the page. There we go. So content security policy is telling us that um, an attempt to execute inline script has been foiled. But at the bottom, uh, there's a button that when we press the button, something's supposed to happen. And if we look at the source for this in the debugger, we can see that it's inline script. And hopefully, when I click that button, it will work. Yay, there we go. It's working, it's working now, because look, it's got the current time. You can see I'm not cheating. Um, so how is it that this script um, here is failing, and this script here is succeeding? Well, you'll see an attribute on the top script element that's called nonce. And the way script nonce works is you have a nonce, a nonce is a number that's used once, and you... Um, Put that in your CSP header. Let's have a look at the header that gets sent with this document. Uh, there we go. See the response headers. Here is our CSP request. And we can see default source is self. We know what that means. Script source, nonce, and then the nonce value that we saw earlier on. Now, any script element within the document that has that um, attribute value will be allowed. Anything that doesn't, won't. And because the number's only used once, an attacker doesn't know what that is. Um, and if they can read it, you've already been cross-site scripted, right? <laughs> so that's script nonce and why it's really useful. Now, this is really useful if you've got um, control over the application framework that you're using. If you're using one of the open source web frameworks, it's really easy to hack stuff into the framework to automatically add uh, nonce attributes and automatically add CSP response headers. Uh, you've got to be really careful, though. Why have you got to be really careful? Because if you go adding the nonce attributes to um, elements that are just in the response and you haven't checked that they're supposed to be there, then you've got the exact problem that you had with the cross-site scripting in the first place. Okay. So what you have to do is you have to make sure that um, if your framework has a way of determining where the template came from. So in the case of Django, your template files, in the case of um, 
in the case of PHP, whether the stuff comes from user input or whether it was in the original PHP file. Uh, unless you've got a way of doing that, it's potentially kind of dangerous. Now, part of the problem with this is that your attack surface might not just be in dynamic web content. And remember, we showed a DOM cross-site scripting attack earlier on, and we showed that in a document that was completely sta static. Um, and what that means is that the, the stuff you have on your website, the brochureware, if you like, that isn't doing anything, it's just being served to people, um, depending on how um, your web devs have done stuff, depending on your front-end JavaScript guys or what libraries they use, more annoyingly, there might be vulnerabilities in that stuff too. And really, you want to be able to fix that problem. Uh, and if you apply a blanket CSP that does loads of restrictive stuff, then all of your fancy JavaScript based um, on mouse over things are not going to work anymore, and that's bad news too. And this is where the other thing comes in, this, um, this hash source thing. Um, hash source. Um, now, hash source, hash source is kind of like um, script nonce in that it's designed to allow you to use inline elements without breakage. But it differs in that you don't have to change the document that you're applying the policy to at all. Okay? Now, that's kind of useful. So, what we can do is we can take a document that was vulnerable earlier on, like, for example, uh, this one, remember that had the problem, and if we change that to a different directory, I call it Don't make me look at the file system. Okay. Very strange. Ah. What's that one called? It was called DOMXSS. Okay. There we go. So we've got the same thing, the same problem, but the script is being prevented. Now, if we go to another one, which I called inline, we can see that this time there are inline scripts and it's still working. <laughs> Except it isn't. Okay. But this is okay because that's the next the part of the demo anyway, right? So what we're going to do now is we're going to take this document here that's supposed to work and is now broken. See, look, it's got some inline script that's being prevented by CSP. And we're going to create a CSP that we can apply to it. Okay. Um, and we're going to do that by running a thing... Yeah. Okay. Now, what I did was I threw together a, an application which will allow you to give it any file that looks like HTML. It will apply a um, parser to it, pull out all the script elements, find the value of all the script elements, and automatically create a CSP. So if we cat .htaccess, you see it's created a bunch of CSP directives, the CSP default source self, script source, and then a bunch of source values, which are um, <coughs> things which would match what is in the documents in that directory. So if I move that to... there... Hopefully, if I refresh this, yay, there we go. So what we've done, with, with no work on the source document at all, it's a static file, we can't do this kind of thing without, um, with, with a framework that's being used. We can run something over a set of directories, a set of files, and get what we need to make stuff work, which is kind of nice. So... Let's OK. 
area. So the thing that's happened that's important then is changes to the spec and better tools to allow you to make use of the changes to the spec. Um, you've seen a demo of some hash generation stuff. Um, we're actually doing some work on modifying Django CSP to allow you to do this to template files on the fly. So um, if you can't use um, if you can't use script nonce, you can make use of script hash instead. So I wanted to finish off with some common mistakes that you find in CSP. Um, the most common mistake is that the policy is too relaxed. You might think if someone's going to the trouble of applying a CSP, they're going to do a lot of homework and find out whether they're doing it properly, right? You'd think they would. Um, <laughs> it, it turns out that they aren't. So two, two data points on this. The first one, the Vericode survey I mentioned earlier on, um, there are 30% more people using a broken CSP than are using one that will actually apply, okay? <laughs> Which is kind of crazy, but there you go. Um, another thing is that um, people are making CSPs that will apply but are actually completely useless. So there's a guy called Kailash Patel who's done some work on um, CSP header survey specifically. And you can't read this, but you can have a look later, or, or, but I'll, and I'll tell you about it now. Um, this policy here allows all of the things that CSP turns off. So they've gone to the trouble of setting a, a header and putting all the directives in just to turn CSP off, basically, which is kind of odd. And you see that kind of stuff a lot. Um, another problem that you find is that people do really hard work on making sure that their policy is just right, and then in a different path on the same server, they have something that's still completely vulnerable. Now, I mentioned the sort of brochureware static content thing earlier on. This is a huge source of that vulnerability. And you've actually got to be careful with some of the frameworks as well. So I mentioned Django CSP earlier on, and I mentioned it was awesome. Um, in balance to that, have a look at this. Um, what this means is if you're running Django CSP, um, there we go, by default on your server, the URL prefix of admin will not have CSP applied to it. Okay, so that's worth knowing as well. Now that's all I wanted to talk about. Hopefully we've got a little bit of time for questions. Except not using it, but is there um, any uh, good way of dealing with trackers and CSP? A good way of dealing with trackers in CSP? That's a good question. So um, Kailash Patel, the guy who wrote the paper I just showed you, he also wrote a tool called User CSP. And the intention of User CSP was, was twofold. The first was to allow users to apply their own CSP to third-party websites. So if you visited your bank, for example, uh, and you thought they're their security was a little bit lax. You could run this tool, it would infer a security policy from you running through it once, and you could then apply that policy every subsequent visit to your bank. But you can also use this for things like dealing with trackers, because what you could do, um, in fact, it would be a fun thing to try, write a Chrome or Firefox add-on that injects a CSP header that denies requests to domains that you don't like, like, I don't know, Facebook or Google or whatever. Um, so CSP could be used as a mechanism for that sort of thing. Um, I've not seen it used like that yet, but it could be. Chris, we got any, any more time, Chris? Yeah. What's uh, the status of browser support? What's the status of browser support? So um, every deployed version of Chrome, pretty much, because they're very aggressive with it auto-update will have CSP 1.1 um, support mostly now, um, and uh, everyone running Firefox 3 or later will have support for some version or other. Um, most Firefox and Chrome users are on recent versions, so probably 
somewhere in the region of a billion plus users. Oh, so so the only thing that's the only browser that doesn't support it at all is Internet Explorer. Um, I'm hoping they change that soon. Um, TSP one is supported well by um, Opera and Chrome and Firefox in you know since like a year and a bit ago. TSP one point one the two main features I talked about there were um, went into beta I think last week or something so you can try those in a Firefox soon and a Chrome now okay, thank you Mark thank you very much